Foundation, and you can find us online at FamilyHistoryFoundation.com. And uh, you're watching YouTube, and uh, you can like and subscribe to our channel and get all the latest notifications. Check out all of our other videos. But today, we are going to take you live to an article entitled 15 Eleanor of Aquitaine books historians have on their shelf. And so every serious medieval historian has Eleanor of Aquitaine books on their shelf. And below is an annotated bibliography of 15 books that I have read and or own about the person who I consider to be history's greatest queen. Eleanor of Aquitaine had it all. She had land, she had power, she had beauty. She was intelligent and cunning beyond her age. She also lived at the intersection of royal medieval genealogies before the rise of the heraldic sciences, which places her in a super amazing position in history, uh, placing her firmly in the realm of antiquity. All of the Eleanor of Aquitaine books cannot stack up against the actual magnificence of the Queen Mother of Europe herself. However, since we do not live in the 12th century and none of us have actually met her ourselves, we will have to puzzle together a mosaic of her personage based on written material about one of history's greatest monarchs. Thankfully, there are quite a few Eleanor of Aquitaine books out there to satiate our thirst to learn about history's greatest queen. And you can also check out my books about books, a few couture recommendations posts, and you can head over to uh, FamilyHistoryFoundation.com to check that out. So this is your royal reading list. Woohoo! So below are Eleanor of Aquitaine books that I have read and I own. Again, each one is followed by a synopsis and general comments of how one might approach reading them, as each of these have their own tendencies toward history and level of familiarity with the subject. Okay, so as I go through each one, just going to be reading those comments. For example, while Ralph Turner and Bonnie Wheeler's works are focused more for academic historians, Amy Kelly and Marion Mead's books are written for a wider audience uh, with much more elaboration than actual, actual history. Um, Alison Weir's book seems to capture the best of both worlds, in my opinion. <clears throat> and uh, links to all the books themselves um, complete with either Amazon or eBooks links uh, can be found in the references section at the very end of this article. So if you go and head over there, you can scroll down through all of the books as they're treated individually, or you can do the references at the end, uh, which we'll cover in sec. So I want to take you through uh, these 15, and I hope you're excited because the book nerd in me is very excited. But before we actually jump into the books, uh, quick Eleanor of Aquitaine facts <clears throat> that I think is relevant. She was born in 1122 and died on April 1st, 1204. And she was born in either Poitiers or the castle of Berlin uh, in Bordeaux, France. Um, and that is according to Mead, uh, page 18. Uh, her name means the other Aenor. Um, so Alia or Aelia, Aenor. Um, Aelia being, you know, a reference to alien, so extra or other, um, named after her mother, Aenor. So she was the other one. And her father is uh, William X, who lived from 1099 to 1137, who was Duke of Aquitaine, Duke of Gascony, and Count of Poitou. And her Eleanor's mother was Enor of Chateron, aka Enor of Rochefoucauld. Uh, her sister was Petronilla of Aquitaine, who lived from 1125 until 1151, and she married Raoul I, Count of Vermandois. And her brother, unfortunately, who died at the age of four, was William Egret. <clears throat> Eleanor is interred in a very, very sacred and special place called Fontrevaux Abbey, France. Uh, Fontrevaux was a very special place, uh, her favorite place, her spiritual home located in the Loire Valley, almost between the cities of Ange and Tours. 
and you can actually, and I would suggest going to the site to link to the pronunciation pronunciation link here and I apologize for my attempts at uh, the French language here. <laughs> Fontevaux is actually closer to the pronunciation like it should be. <laughs> uh, so her, sp her spouse, uh, spouse is uh, of course King Louis the seventh of France and um, then her the marriage that set her career alight and set her ablaze in, in the world of history in the world of uh, being renowned for all the things she accomplished was, of course, married to King Henry II of England. Um, and that was uh, very, very special. Um, so the first book is Marion Meads Eleanor of Aquitaine, um, a biography. And uh, as I would sus suspect that off, out of all of the Eleanor of Aquitaine books, Marion Meads is the most popular. Okay, and you know one could make the argument that it's either hers or Amy Kelly's work, which is listed number five below. Uh, but in any case, uh, Marion Mead's Eleanor of Aquitaine, a biography, is certainly one of the most balanced books on the subject of our most illustrious Queen of the Middle Ages. Uh, Marion Mead's book is superbly and enchantingly written. Her powers of narrative and bringing historical figures to life in this book are simply spellbinding. And what I especially love about this book is that all of the family of Queen Eleanor and King Henry II, as well as uh, both of their predecessors, are covered throughout its 389 pages. <clears throat> she leaves no one out. And it's nice. You're not just focusing on the queen, but the families of her and King Henry. Uh, she captures uh, the thoughts and politics behind the incredible mesh and amplified pressure of being a member of the royal family in the 12th century and 12th century France and England. Um, not just a member, Eleanor was a force to be reckoned with. I like that. A charger, a changer, an artist at redrawing boundaries, a leader, and no better metaphor can be used to describe her presence than the stage on which she moved. And that's taken from Marion Mead's book uh, in the introduction. Okay. And so moving on to number two, uh, Alison Weir's Eleanor of Aquitaine, A Life. <clears throat> Alison Weir, hands down, is a superb writer, one of my favorite authors, honestly. Um, <clears throat> and she seems to effortlessly capture the times and personalities of the people of the age um, as if she bore witness to the amazing life of Queen Eleanor herself and then is simply retelling the tale to us. Uh, so you see the cover here. We, and you should also know uh, when you're looking at books that were published in the UK and the US, so there, there will be different covers. Um, for each of those different audiences. <clears throat> Her treatment of Eleanor of Aquitaine is my favorite book on this list. Uh, it is so vibrant and caring and historically accurate uh, that one will never look upon the Plantagenet era the same again. Alison Weir appears on this list two more times, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, number eight and number 10, uh, as no one else has really contributed more to the historical narrative of Eleanor of Aquitaine than her. Uh, she describes Eleanor of Aquitaine as no shrinking violet, <laughs> but a tough, capable, and resourceful woman who traveled widely throughout the known world and was acquainted with the most, with most of the great figures of the age. That's an incredible quote, um, which comes from her book on page 346. Um, so if you're looking for your first Eleanor of Aquitaine book to start with, this is the one I would recommend. So... Eleanor of Aquitaine Life. Moving on to number three. This gets very interesting. So we see here Ralph Turner's book, Eleanor of Aquitaine, of course. What else would it be titled? Um, this book is actually written uh, with more of an academic audience in mind. <clears throat> Ralph Turner is less concerned about narrative and more concerned about his fellow historians in this book, which is interesting. Uh, although there is nothing wrong with that per se, the slant becomes very obvious if you picked up this book for a nice, easy Sunday read by the pool, right? So it's not written for an audience to sort of play up the narrative and make it more fun, but it was really sort of more fact-laden as a historian would actually like. Uh, that being said, uh, this book is very careful and clear in its intent, which is the dispossess any assumptions that modern readers may have inadvertently placed on the subject of a woman's role in medieval society 
based on our own standards, which means our modern standards. And Turner writes in his introduction, to understand Eleanor today, we must confront the sharply differing standards of her medieval contemporaries and of authors in subsequent centuries right up to today in depicting a powerful woman's place in medieval society and govern it. Uh, Eleanor deserves to be seen on her own terms, not pressed into conformity with 21st century preconceptions. Um, and I really like that. So this book is a great choice for those looking for Eleanor of Aquitaine books with just the facts. Okay. And so moving on to number four, we have Bonnie Wheeler and John C. Parsons, who are the editors. Um, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Lord and Lady. Ooh, that's a really catchy title. So anytime you see EDS, uh, it means editors. So they were the principal editors. Um, <clears throat> and this book, uh, Bonnie Wheeler and John Parsons are the editors of this wonder book in a, wonderful book in a series called The New Middle Ages. Bonnie Wheeler is the series editor. With contributions from over 20 authors spanning 19 chapters, a prologue and an epilogue, <laughs> you really get the whole gamut of perspectives and topics with respect to Eleanor of Aquitaine. Just think, all of these scholars came together and collaborated just to talk about history's greatest queen. How cool is that? This book even features our previous author, Ralph V. Turner, who contributed chapter three. And it's an excellent chapter, by the way. Uh, this Eleanor of Aquitaine book is very special and unique in that you have over 20 experts, each giving their insight into specific aspects of Eleanor's life that they have specialized in researching. So you really, really get some specialized uh, academic treatment here. It's all very academic and makes for an unparalleled read. It's like the difference between an internist and a specialist in the medical field, right? And in this case, all the specialists are assembled in one place to answer any question you could possibly conceive, metaphorically speaking, of course. And this book is for the probing scholar and advanced Eleanor reader. Okay, so next is uh, Amy Kelly's Eleanor of Aquitaine and the Four Kings. Really, really popular as, as far as, you know, publications go. Um, and uh, Amy Kelly has truly written a masterpiece in her 427 page book that has probably been reprinted more than any other book on this list, including Marion Mead's number one. Okay. Um, ironically, <laughs> what has propelled Amy Kelly into the limelight has also served to undermine her reputation, uh, according to a few of her detractors, okay? Uh, that is that she has sacrificed factual research for fanciful writing, okay? So be clear, these aren't things that I am saying, uh, just what other Eleanor of Aquitaine books and authors have themselves said about uh, Eleanor and the Four Kings. So wherever you stand, uh, or not, or where you care at all, this book is a fantastic and fun read. Uh, Amy Kelly describes aspect of Queen Eleanor's journey through life that others don't seem to quite capture. Um, <clears throat> for instance, in one of my favorite lines, she writes, uh, Henry already knew his island, of course, referring to uh, her wife, Henry II. Uh, but in the course of these early journeyings, Eleanor had her first sight of the realm for which she had forsworn the more settled domain of her overlord in Paris. It was such, such a beautiful way of putting uh, her leaving uh, the marriage with her first husband, the King of France, and going over to Henry and to view the British Isles for the first time. It's just a superb, superbly written uh, sentence right there. Um, and this book is for the flight of fancy reader. That's how I like to imagine it. Um, on to number six, okay. Uh, Desmond Seward's Eleanor of Aquitaine. And uh, this is an interesting book. And, uh, you know, I'm going to give you my comments here. <laughs> I, I first remember seeing Desmond Seward's book on the shelves uh, while I was browsing at Barnes & Noble. I was initially uh, unimpressed. I have to say, by this book's lack of girth at only 288 pages. 
However, I quickly became intrigued by remembering the fact that Seward's name was specifically mentioned by Alison Weir herself in her book, Eleanor of Aquitaine, which is number two on the list. So that kind of impressed me, right? Uh, Alison Weir, one of my favorite authors, with her own analysis of the role of Queen Eleanor as the greatest queen of Europe, praises Desmond Seward for his use of the phrase, the queen mother of Europe, as entirely prescient, prescient and justified. Quite the kudos, okay? Mm-hmm. So his book entitled Eleanor of Aquitaine, Queen Mother of the Middle Ages, you know, confirms that position, I guess. Uh, while we're not going into the depth of her life in the way that any of the previous authors on this list have, uh, Seward does capture the essence of the spirit of such an important medieval luminary. Uh, Seward is not just writing to write, uh, he's thrown his hat into the ring as an author. Um, You know, he has done historical homework on many a controversial topic, uh, which he delves into with clarity of mind and pen. For example, one of my favorite parts of this book is how he strips down the evil reputation of King John while at the same time building him up for his would-be positive attributes, uh, balancing both analytical truth and conjecture. And I really appreciate that because people sort of... King John, people just in in their books tend to just slag him off and just write him off super easily. But I, I really appreciate the way that he sort of tried to recapture and uplift his reputation. Okay. Uh, Anyway, this book is a middling read, I would call it, especially in comparison to other works like uh, Demon's Brood, which I found unappealing, if I have to uh, be honest, which was another book by Desmond Seward. He wrote a book, Demon's Brood. I just did not really care for it at all. Uh, So Polly Books, uh, Queen Eleanor, Independent Spirit of the Medieval World, and some of these ones we're getting into now are are sort of like... (laughs) you know, tertiary uh, publications. And uh, this list is really to compile a lot of what is out there that you may know or may not know. So again, if you haven't heard of some of these next titles, um, it's good to know because they're kind of cool and you're like, ooh, what is this book about? Okay. And for number seven, uh, you know, I'm writing my review. To be fair, I haven't read this book. (laughs) However, to be honest, it wouldn't take that long. At only 166 pages of text, Uh, 183 pages total, um, it seems to be more of an introduction to Eleanor readers uh, for young readers, which would make it a valuable, obviously, uh, a value. I purchased this particular book in Texas at Half Price uh, Books in Dallas, uh, the main store, along with a host of other medieval titles. Um, All I saw, uh, the book nerd in me saw, was a Queen Eleanor book in the title, and I knew I had to have it, so I got it. From perusing its pages, Polly Brooks seems to have done a nice job framing Queen Eleanor within the topics she's chosen. I also appreciate her use of images as topical guideposts, which are appropriately strewn throughout the text. And this is sort of refreshing. Um, And I wish more authors would sort of jump on this tactic. (laughs) And this is a great book for young readers and even those who are looking for their first book to read on the life of Eleanor of Aquitaine. So, you know, you can bookmark this one if you want. Um, Polly Brooks. Next, Captive Queen. And here we have Alison Weir appearing once again. Um, And this is a very, very interesting, (laughs) very, very interesting publication here. And as I'm saying here, another facet in the jewel of Eleanor of Aquitaine books by Alison Weir. Yes, there are more than two. (laughs) Um, And uh, while she already knocked it out of the park with her masterpiece, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Life, number two on the list, Captive Queen is the historical fiction version. Get that. It's a historical fiction. This is another book I have not yet read. However, while I'm not a complete fan of historical fictions, which is why I never really got into reading it, I am a complete fan of Alison Weir, so, you know, I might have to give this a read one day. Um, This book, more appropriately called a novel, is written in the first person, right? It's not a historian writing in the third person. She's writing it as if she was Eleanor of Aquitaine in the first person. Kind of cool, actually. Uh, Unlike books written about a subject in the third person, Weir has accomplished what few other authors authors dare to even attempt, to put their 
own words into the mouths of the subjects they are both describing and portraying. Heck, it even says a novel of Eleanor of Aquitaine on the cover. <laughs> um, and I, I really, really have a lot of respect to, for that. Uh, by comparison, Johannes Fried did this with the infamous King Charlemagne uh, in a very, very, very amazing publication on King Charlemagne. Uh, not an easy literary task. So uh, this book is perfect for the wanderlust reader who dreams of wistfully being transported back in time. So Alison Weir's book, this has got to be pretty cool, Captive Queen. Um, and now we come to number nine. Ooh, this is a newer publication, which actually actually kind of bowled me over when I saw it. <clears throat> Sarah Cockrell, uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Queen of France and England, Mother of Empires. Pretty darn catchy title, hey? <clears throat> So this is a new re newly released 2020 published book about Eleanor of Aquitaine, okay? And while I have admittedly never read a book by this author, and I haven't, I'm uh, until now reading this book, I am intensely looking forward to reading this magisterial hardcover beauty. And I have actually read it already. Um, and it was just astoundingly good and thorough. <laughs> um, I literally just picked this up from Amazon along with her next title on the list, number 10. And at 448 pages, this offering looks truly worthy of a book about England's greatest queen, and it is. Um, and from digging into Cockrell's preface, I can tell this book is going to be a wild ride. And trust me, after reading it, it was a wild ride. It was really, really cool the way she challenged so many things <clears throat> and her stance is compelling in that her approach to the subject of our queen is to dispel all of the untruths about Eleanor that have been either romanticized or politicized about her presumed role as some sort of proto-feminist so I like how she taxes from different angles uh, she admonishes quite succinctly this is a key point for which my readers should be prepared before they go any further into this book. What you think you know about Eleanor may not be true. <laughs> How can you not want to keep reading after that? Um, in fact, after finishing her preface, I know this book, and I knew it was going to be a breath of fresh air, which it turned out it actually was after uh, reading, finished reading it. Um, and this book is for the discerning mind and comparative Eleanor historian. So if you're like me and you've read about 10 books on the subject, say you read everything else on this list and you're thinking you're going to pick up this book here and it's just going to be another bland, boring rehashing of whatever's been talked about, forget it. This book is going to really add to the sort of uh, historiography of our queen. So really cool. And number 10, here she comes again, Alison Weir with uh, a mention of Queen Eleanor in Queens of the Crusades. So this is interesting because it's not a book entirely dedicated to Queen Eleanor, but she's given a lot of sort of mention and center stage in a lot of this. Uh, so this this is actually such a superlative book. I can't say enough about how amazing this actual whole book was. Um, as a 2021 publication, um, it's a book I have been anticipating. Uh, Queens of the Crusades is book two in a four-part series on the medieval queens of England. So the first part was entitled Queens of the Conquest, and the link you find on this uh, article will take you to a book review I did for it. Um, and I actually have a book review for Queens of the Crusades as well. Uh, as ba basically written one of my all-time favorite books, and I'm really serious about this. It really is perfect from tip to toe, as it details all the queens during England's conquest period, circa 1066 to 1154, uh, when Stephen of Blois was sort of uh, ended his reign. <laughs> uh, I am and have read this 560 page book with absolute veracity. <clears throat> that being said, this book makes my list even though it's not a book entirely dedicated to Queen Eleanor herself. Uh, rather, Eleanor is the subject of part one of her book, which includes the first 16 chapters, and there are five parts total. So it's a substantive part. Um, and this book is perfect for the reader wanting to place Eleanor Aquitaine into the larger 
the, the broader political history of her age, which I think is so important, with a more robust, robust treatment of her contemporaries. And you can see my, a link to my full book review uh, below. And uh, head on over to Family History Foundation to check that out. Number 11, and uh, Eleanor, Queen of the Troubadours. <laughs> so uh, this is another gem I found well, at Half Price Books in Texas. And uh, <clears throat> Jean Markle's book, on the surface, seems to be a somewhat fanciful treatment of the mystical and, dare I say, salacious aspects of Queen Eleanor that have been suggested throughout the ages. And if you're new to reading about Queen Eleanor, this may come as a surprise, but if you're a sort of uh, accomplished historian on the subject, you will no, no doubt have heard these sort of uh, allegations <laughs> more than once. A queen of the Troubadours attempts to inexorably connect the life of Eleanor of Aquitaine to the, artly, the art of courtly love of early France. Marcol does this in an interesting way, however, using a myriad of sources from ancient Celtic rites to the chansons de geste themselves as textual analysis. Uh, these chansons were the songs of deeds, the songs of champions that uh, ultimately came and were derived from <clears throat> King Charlemagne himself. <clears throat> it is quite interesting as a matter of fact. This book is at the same time daring and conservative. And by that I mean while there are a few bold statements in this book, the author takes time to explain them uh, fairly handily. Uh, for instance, on the subject of Eleanor of Aquitaine's supposed bad reputation, <laughs> fill in the blanks, uh, she writes, For this, Celtic legends and the quasi-adoration of Ovid, with all the pagan context emanating from his work, constituted a formidable weapon and forced a breach in a fundament fundamentally gynophobic Christianity. Now, that's a statement. <laughs> this is the perfect book for the already initiated Eleanor fan. If you've never read a, anything on her, I would not suggest starting with this. <laughs> and 12, we're kind of reaching into more of the paltry type of uh, books. But again, this list is, I wanted it to be somewhat comprehensive. So I threw in everything that I found that I had and, and came across. So <clears throat> uh, this is a Hourly History, <laughs> Eleanor of Aquitaine. <laughs> and this last book on the list is hardly a book at all. Um, ironically, I wouldn't imagine any serious historian have it, having it on their shelf. Um, and the title of this article is, you know, 15 Eleanor of Aquitaine books historians have on their shelf, um, except to complete a collection, which is precisely why I own it. <laughs> um, there is a quickly written, this is a quickly written pamphlet, I'm not even calling it a book, which is not even paginated at 49 pages, and I know, I had to count all of them to figure out how many pages there were. Uh, it's really a glossing of Eleanor's life and legacy, which m may be only appropriate for a five-minute quick study. So it, I mean, it's just, it's here just because it has her name on it, and it has pages, basically. Uh, for a better introduction, if you're looking for one, see number seven on this list. Also, if you're looking for your first read on History's Greatest Queen, I would definitely re recommend starting with Alison Weir's 2008 Eleanor of Aquitaine Life, which is number two. <clears throat> Almost there, 13. Uh, Regine Pernou, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, and I have not read this particular book, but it is mentioned by Sarah Cockerell in her book, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Queen of France and England, number nine. It seems to be one of the preeminent books on Eleanor written from a noted and very highly respected French historian, and that excites me. So this book is definitely on my purchase and reading list. Uh, Michael Evans, number 14, Inventing Eleanor. Um, Inventing Eleanor attempts to separate the historical mythology from the historical accuracy of who Eleanor of Aquitaine really was, which is not an easy task. Okay, So this book seeks clarification on many fronts, not the least of which was her supposed scandals 
and feminist roles within the context of the times in which she lived. And which is, of course, why Sarah Cockrell's book mentions Michael Evans and uh, the previous uh, book up here. Okay, And last but not least and uh, is number 15, which <laughs> comes as a part of a series. And again, this book is on the list because I found it. Um, at a book sale and didn't even know it existed but so I bought it and I just had to kind of go in on it and it's on the list um, uh, book nerd alert this is a nifty uh, if dated pictorial history about Eleanor of Aquitaine if you're looking for an introductory read it is replete with images which is always fun that are well placed and highlight the text very eloquently uh, this book is a part of the world leader series and you know, pausing right there to sort of say, how cool is it that if it's part if they do if someone did a series on the leaders of the world and devotes one of those books in the series just to Eleanor of Aquitaine, that's cool. Uh, speaks highly of the series and focuses mainly on Queen Eleanor's leadership style, role in a medieval family, and contributions to European history. Awesome. The introduction was done by author. Schlesinger, who is the famous American historian. Um, <clears throat> and that rounds out the list. So I put up a list of references, and you can head over to FamilyHistoryFoundation.com. Follow the link in uh, the description, which will give you uh, the page to go to. And, you know, you can kind of go off of all of these links here, which is pretty cool if you want to sort of head over to either Amazon or eBooks, um, depending on the sort of... Uh, availability of the book I've given you different options and that concludes it and I'll leave you with uh, thanks for listening and sharing and subscribing and liking and this is an actual picture here of my bookshelf with not, about 95% of my Eleanor of Aquitaine books some uh, are not on this particular shelf but I tried to keep them all together so that uh, you can see them anyway thanks for listening